these holidays or feast days, I shouldn't say, well, they were all holidays, you couldn't work on them. Uh, these feast days could be different each year. As you know, like the 4th of July, that we always celebrate it on the same day, but it's always on the 4th. These would happen the same way. So you could have a Sabbath on a Wednesday if it was a feast day. That could happen. When there was a holy convocation, it was a Sabbath day. And then, because it was a special feast day, it would be called High Sabbath. A special Sabbath, a special celebration. So there were more Sabbath days than just the seventh day. Each, whenever there's a holy convocation, no one works. And we see these spelled out in the scriptures. Just give you an... Um, now, characteristics of these days was the prohibition of work, the convocation was called by the blowing of special trumpets. Numbers 10, 2, and 10. We'll talk about which trumpets they used, but they would blow a trumpet to announce them. Now the Passover, and this is the one that most Christians know best, we spoke about it. The first mention of it is Exodus chapter 12, 1 and 2. And I think I will read this. Let's see. Not all of it. Uh, it is, we mentioned, the first month of Israel's religious calendar. And I gave the, two, the name is there, Abib, later called Nisan. And the Abib means fresh young ears. I said buds. It's actually more exactly fresh young ears. And it was when barley was harvested in March and April. So, this is a new identity, a new religious calendar given to the Jews. And you can see someone with a hyssop branch putting the blood above their door on each side. And the angel of death would pass over that night. Now, after Israel is taken into captivity, four of the twelve months are given Babylonian names. April is now called Nisan, so Abi becomes Nisan. But it is the same celebration. They haven't changed it, but they have changed the name. And let's see. Nisan means early or start, meaning you're starting the new religious calendar year. So, just if you see those two, you'll know it's the same month. <laughs> now, what it represents here. First of all, through that shedding of blood, the lamb's blood, putting on the doorpost, that night, every firstborn son, every firstborn animal, every firstborn slave, male slave, died that night in Egypt. Uh, from the prison to the palace, if you were the firstborn, you were dead, unless there was blood put above the doorpost and on the sides of your house. So, blood is shed, and Pharaoh, who loses his first son, and his servants who lose their first sons, they, at this point, they're like, they, they've been refusing to let Moses go into the wilderness with the Jews to worship. Get out of here before we're all dead. That was the attitude of, the, of, of Egyptians. So they're free. So if you will, Passover, through the blood, speaks of liberation from slavery in Egypt. To us as Christians, you look at it, and John, I've got John uh, here, liberation from the slavery of Satan and sin. So if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Now that Jesus set us free through his blood, in our faith in his blood. Amen. The Jews had to exercise faith in the blood. They had to <laughs> slaughter the lamb and put the blood above the doorpost because they believed it was going to spare them from death. Yeah. So faith in the blood liberates us from Satan and it liberates us from sin. This is the Son of Man beginning to set us free, if you will. He, there are different areas in our life. We know we have a progressive walk with Christ. Where the different things he will have to set us free from. And he will do this. But we are saved from death. We are saved from hell. We are saved from the punishment of sin through blood. So that's what it represents to us. Yeah. Now, we mentioned the day. It is important. 14th, month of Nisan. In the afternoon, they would prepare this meal. It means you have to slaughter the animal in the afternoon. And then at night, you eat the Seder 
or the Passover feast. And it's, you know, Jesus died the ninth hour at three in the afternoon. We would calculate at three in the afternoon. So while they're slaughtering the lamb and preparing him to eat, Jesus is dying at the very same time of day. Not just the same day, but the same time of day. It's, it's exact. Here it is. It's happening before our eyes. They're living out with the future. After the temple was destroyed, there was no more animal sacrifice in Judaism for the most part. No, no proper temple sacrifice. Some Orthodox Jews actually on the Day of Atonement will kill a chicken and confess their sins over it. It's really strange because there's no chicken is, is not an acceptable sacrifice in, in the Mosaic Law, but I've seen pictures of it. You, you know, it's the animal rights groups have put it out. They get all upset about this. She was killing this poor chicken. Of course, you go to Kentucky Fried and you don't cry. But anyway, so, you know, I don't want to get into that too much. Uh, <laughs> so, but this is what's going on. Now, Let's see. This is what a Seder actually looks like today. And we're going to look at a little bit of it because what it represents. This is how a Passover is celebrated to this day in a Jewish home. So the 14th day, the first month, the new first month, uh, starting a new Jewish religious calendar, Nisan, in the afternoon the Seder is prepared. In the evening it will be eaten. Before 70 AD, it would include lamb, bitter herbs, speaking of the bitter life that they had in Egypt. We, I mentioned this preaching Sunday, was it, that Egypt is called an iron furnace. Slavery, bondage, and affliction. An iron furnace. And these, these bitter herbs speak of that. And then unleavened bread. The leaven is sin, there's no sin in it, no hypocrisy. And it speaks of humility, too. And it's, if you will, it speaks of Christ's body. She's being, his bones are not broken, but his body was broken. Okay? And buried, laid low in a tomb, laid down in a tomb. Now, we a little we'll keep going here. When this lamb was sacrificed, you were forbidden to break a single bone in that lamb. The fulfillment is in John 19, 31 through 36. Now, though Jesus was brutalized and beaten, his face was unrecognizable. They had so pummeled him and punched him. His face just swelled. He didn't look like a man anymore, if you will. But not a bone in his body was broken. And because the Passover was, not the Passover, because the Sabbath was coming the next day, they did you couldn't work on the Sabbath, which means you couldn't crucify someone on the Sabbath. That was considered work. So the two thieves that were with him, there they, they, they took a piece of wood and bashed their legs to break them. And so what they could do, they could no longer push themselves up on the cross to breathe. So they would asphyxiate and die quickly. They never did this to Jesus because he was already dead. So he dies before he's ever had his legs broken. And Pilate was surprised when he was dead after six hours. But that was the report he received. And just to make sure, a Roman soldier ran a spear up through his side. Okay, This is very important. Uh, you, How many have heard anybody tell you that Jesus didn't really die? He was just swooning on the cross. But you hear that? One, two, three, four, yeah, five. But half of you have heard that, yes. Well, they're right and they're wrong. A normal crucifixion, if you're not beaten first, if you're not lashed 39 times, if you don't sweat great drops of blood and emotional turmoil so your body's a wreck to begin with, you can survive six hours of crucifixion. It shouldn't kill you after six hours, torture you, but not kill you. So, but, once you take a person on a cross for six nights and he, and he fixed, Jesus just gave up the, the spirit and he died and ran a spear up into his heart, you don't swoon after that, folks. You're just playing all absolutely perfectly. you got a spear up through your heart. You're dead. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. There's no swooning. All right, so that's an important fact, that fifth wound. Just to make sure, no swooning theories, folks, doesn't fit the facts. 
If you don't believe me, we can run a spear up through you and see if you live. No takers on that. Anyways, all right. Now, when they celebrate the Passover, the part of it that most fascinated me is, is the matzah or self, or the unleavened bread. And you see it there. Matzah is striped, and matzah is pierced. And Jesus' body was first striped, and then his body was what? Pierced, just like the unleavened bread. So in this simple piece of bread, shows what they did to our Lord. Not everybody is striped, and not everybody is pierced. But Christ was. And of course he was, uh, if you will, on these feast days, showing this thing. It's an incredible testimony. Amen. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I, we've covered most of what's on that page here. Yeah, I mentioned a scripture here, uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that they were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The perfect lamb, the sinless lamb, he is striped, he is pierced, is, he, he is crucified for us and it is betrayed in the Passover feast. Now, all, during this feast, be, before you start eating, they take three matzahs, always three, and they put them in a napkin. And they take out the middle matzah, they break it, and then they hide it somewhere in the household. The children will we'll actually later on in the ceremony, they will go find that, broke. by the way, the, the, the larger piece is, is broken off and hidden. They will find that the final thing they will do is take the middle matzah and eat it. That ends the Seder. What it speaks of is Christ's body, when it was buried, it was out of sight. You could not see it. It was hidden. At his resurrection, it was found again. And it speaks of a second thing that's really very important. Christ in many ways has been hidden from the Jews. Though this is their feast, and this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and this Seder that they celebrate today speaks of Christ loud and clear. Only a few Jews have been saved, and this has been right through history. All the apostles were Jews, some were saved, but not many. So if you will, Christ, the middle months, remember Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the middle man. All right? So it fits perfectly. We're supposed to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's the second person of the Trinity. So he's hidden from the Jews, and they will have to find him again. And when they find him, that will be the end of the tribulation. Okay? And then there'll be something to celebrate, the millennial reign. There will be a feast to feast. So we have this an incredible type of to Christ, and how this was all kept through history by God. Jews doing this and not knowing the significance of what are they told? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Priest, Levite, and layperson. But it, it really speaks of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Trinity who was broken on a cross for us and buried. There's a little boy finding his... Uh, the uh, the middle of matzah. Let's see. It has a special name. Afrikoman. And let's see if I, if I missed out any details here. Before the Seder begins, the middle of matzah is broken in half. The smaller piece is placed back in the plate, and the larger one is wrapped and hidden if there are kids in the Seder. This piece, the larger piece of the middle of matzah, is called the Afrikoman. And that's the one that's eaten at the end. After the matzah has been found by the children and the Seder meal has been eaten, the guests eat the Afrikoman. The last thing they do is partake of the middle matzah that was missing, that was hidden. The last thing the Jews will do at the end of the tribulation period is they will call on Christ. They will finally, if you will, eat the Afrikoman. They'll say yes to their Messiah. In Romans, we did this in the book of Revelations, 
all of Israel will be saved. They'll, in a sense, they'll all eat this Afrikom. They will find the Christ that they have misplaced. They have, it has been hidden from them. Oh, let's see. Just for your notes, the flawless male, one-year-old, is in Exodus 12.5. By the way, it can be a male lamb, or it can be a male goat. Could be either. And they had to eat the whole thing. You, you, you picked the size of the animal. I mean, you could not leave anything. If anything was left, it had to be burned. And the whole thing had to be consumed. So, and I have scriptures here. Let's see, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Jesus was without fault in Isaiah 53, 9. Our God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is fulfilled in the Passover. And of course, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We mentioned the other things here. Oh, lastly, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem means the, the house of bread. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread. Then he was laid in a feeding trough where you put food. So, you know, he's, he's like food offered up for us, if you will. That's what it speaks of. So, uh, you know, he said, I am the bread of life, born in the house of bread in Bethlehem. Laid, designed to be eaten in a manger. We mentioned this breaking. Here's, here's, this is the scripture, Matthew 28, 18, where we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Him listed as the second person of the Trinity. Just where you wonder exactly where that came from. Matthew 28, 18. And I, I've talked about this, so let's move on here a little bit. Hmm. And Jesus said unto them in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And in, in, in the verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. He identifies himself as the bread of life, as the bread from heaven, and he's identified even further in the Seder. As the, as the bread that is striped and that is pierced. Now, the other part, and you can do a whole Seder, there's a lot more symbolism that I'm going to give you, but the, it was required to have four cups of wine. Now you notice they're not really full cups. The idea is not to get drunk here. They, <laughs> they, they, they represent something. They're small cups here. But they each represent, we're going to show you the scriptures, the, during a Seder, you drink these four glasses of wine, or half glasses, small cups, whatever you want to call it. The cup of sanctification, and it represents, we're going to show you the scripture in a minute for you, but it literally means it comes from the place and exit says, I will bring you out. To be set apart, to be brought out. Secondly, it says in the scriptures, I will deliver you. I, I have this in my next notes, I forget where, let's see. It's in Exodus 6, 6 and 7, I have it here. The third one, the cup of redemption, I will redeem you. The fourth cup, the cup of restoration, I will take you out. When Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, he did not drink four cups. He only drank three. When he got to the third cup, the cup of redemption, he said, this is my what, folks? Blood of the new covenant which means you're going to redeem through my blood represented by this cup. Then he said, I will not drink the final cup. He's not going to drink the final cup and to the Jews as a nation receive him at the end of the tribulation period in the millennial reign, he will drink that fourth cup. He saw his rejection coming and so he stopped after the third cup. I'm going to redeem you. But... Uh, I will take you out. The Jews, <laughs> until they receive him fully, he cannot do this. So, let's see. Here, here's the scriptures laid out in front of you. You can see it. Exodus 6, 6 and 7. 
I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. That's the cup of sanctification. I will rescue you from their bondage, cup of deliverance. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judge, cup of redemption. I will take you as my people. The Jews will not be taken fully as God's people until they call on him as Messiah. That's why he would not drink that fourth cup. He knows the beginning before the, oh wait, the end before the beginning. beginning. And he's foretelling it here. Exactly. So, we see this. Which cups did Yeshua drink during the early, the early Passover Seder with his disciples? He drank the first two cups. By the way, it's an early Seder for him because on the actual time we're supposed to be having this meal, he's dead. <laughs> you can't celebrate when you're dead, so he had to celebrate early. That means you know, there's certain things we have to do here. <laughs> we can't do them at all. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, he says in, in Matthew 26, 27 through 39, where it says, this is my blood. Okay. Now, just a note here. When you study the Gospel of John, from chapter 6 forward, the commentators always mention this. I guess it must be real important. I see some importance in it. To uh, 1155 is from one Passover to another. And so the time is dated there from Passover to Passover. And so it's interesting. These feasts are used to keep track of what Jesus is doing and where he is in his ministry. All right. We'll go on from there. Oh, let's see. Passover, there's the Passover night, the feast. The next day begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it's seven days, and for seven days they were forbidden to have leaven in their house. You were disowned. You were no longer a Jew if there was leaven found in your house. And so they actually would search the house, and all leaven was removed. It's a big deal. Now, I, I've told the story about Orthodox Jews. It was told to someone who was studying to become a rabbi and, and then became a Christian. And he said, Orthodox Jews know that, you know, for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there's to be no leaven in the house. Well, they don't want to waste any good leaven. So they take the leaven in the house and they put it in a cupboard and they lock the cupboard and they sell the cupboard to the neighbors. Then at seven days later, they buy the cupboard back from the neighbors. And uh, yes, they actually do this. I know. Now, the funny thing is this, and this is what he said to me. He says, what... Jews do is they build a fence around the wall to make sure that you don't break the law then they find a way around the fence and so they have not actually removed the leaven from their house though they they believe they're living by the strict rule of the law laws are funny things whenever we make one we then find a way around them this is the nature of human beings and so that the Jews would do this is really not surprising. It's human nature. The same is true. You're not supposed to kindle a fire on the Sabbath. Well, scholars, that's, so it means you can't, in modern terms, if you live in an Orthodox Jewish home, you cannot turn a light on or off during the Sabbath. So what do you do? You, you have your neighbor come over and turn the light on or off for you. And of course, your neighbor can't be a Jew. But now, are you... You know, you're not breaking a law, but you found a way, what? Around it. Around it. This is human nature. And if you filled out your Hampton taxes and do the same thing, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we find ways. If we can, there's any way we can, yeah, you know, you don't want to really pay those things if you don't have to. Anyways, so uh, <laughs> we have a law. So I kept the law, but did we really keep the law? No, we didn't. We find a way around the law. This is human beings with a sin nature. <laughs> this is why we need something other than the law. Oh, let's see. We mentioned the yeast symbol of sin. Now, in the New Testament, this symbolism is kept. It's not just Old Testament. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, right? Passover, we know what that means now. Sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Oh, the Passover feast. 
the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's, he's speaking of these feasts now, because I mean something here. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. That's what leaven represents, sin, malice, and wickedness. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. To get all the leaven out to, uh, how do we say it, a messianic Jew or a born-again Christian means to sincerity and truth. You're sincere, you're honest, you're truthful with God and with man. I think we'll stop there, give you a break. In 10 minutes, we'll, we'll keep going with these.